a health convention treating thousands of Americans for free, a pioneer now the global mission director for the Southern Asia Division, and much more coming up next. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Krause. Today's program is coming from the beautiful city of Auckland, New Zealand. And behind me you can see the Sky Tower, which overlooks this city of some 1.5 million people. It's New Zealand's highest structure. And it's used for communication, it's used for observation, and it's also used every year for an annual event to raise money for the New Zealand Leukemia and Blood Foundation. And this firefighters event involves them running up some 1,108 steps to the top. Uh, some describe it as a vertical marathon, and the idea is to get to the top without having a heart attack. And this gives back to the community to help the health and well-being of, of the people who are in need. And on today's program, we'll be looking at Adventists around the world who are also contributing to the health and well-being of their communities. First up, let's travel to Los Angeles, California to see Christ's love being put into action. Los Angeles, California, the second largest city in North America and home to four million people from all walks of life and from all parts of the world. The City of Angels is known for many things, a booming entertainment industry, a spectacular city center, rich cultural experiences, world-class cuisine, and nearly 300 days of sunshine a year. And yet this world-renowned cosmopolitan center is very much like every city. In its shadows live those who struggle to provide for their families, those who struggle to stay well, those who struggle to survive. The need is well known by many local governments, civic leaders and charitable organizations all working to address the challenge. Among them is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a community of faith committed to spreading hope and wholeness to all people. Through a humanitarian service called Your Best Pathway to Health, 4,400 members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, along with friends, family members and colleagues, organized and hosted a free mega clinic on an epic scale. There's people needed in all facets. There's not um, a person who's more important than the other because of the title that they hold. What it is, it's a people coming together and working and bringing the gifts that they already have or gifts that they're discovering if they're a student or a person who's seeking professional development. They can come here, learn, they can see how it works, they can work in a community and they can develop their gifts but, but it's not so much about you know, the title or this, it's more about like, how we can all work together, and that's what makes Pathway so special. Over 300,000 square feet of space at the Los Angeles Convention Center was transformed into a mobile hospital, complete with triage areas, consultation rooms, massage chairs, a full pharmacy, vision testing centers, surgical suites, a massive dental treatment room, and more. Uh, I had a great experience here today. Uh, I've never been able to see so many specialists at one time, or actually ever in my life, I've never seen so many specialists. It's like uh, they dropped an Adventist Kaiser in the middle of LA. <laughs> if anybody, I was skeptical. I really, I, I came to drop somebody off uh, in the vision area, and then when I saw all the other stuff, I was like, I, I have stuff that's been nagging on me for years. I, I wanna get, you know, get taken care of and wow, it was great. It was so everything, everybody's so nice, everybody's so sweet. When you go to a normal clinic and stuff, it's not like that, at least it's my experience, it's not like that. This has been a blessing. Even when I first came in, the doctor prayed with me. It's a whole way different experience than going to a regular clinic. What motivates me um, to help is I wanna do something bigger than myself. And I'm sure that's why we're all here today. We, we are inspired by doing things that are beyond us and, and make an impact. 
into the world and into the community today. My guest is Jeremy Dixon, who is the owner and founder of Revive Cafes here in Auckland. Jeremy, thanks for talking with us. No worries. And this looks absolutely fantastic, and you're going to give me a guided tour. I will. Well, that's most, most welcome to. Let's go in. Okay, so the first thing that hits me here are these magnificent looking cookbooks. What's the story with these, Jeremy? Yes, yeah, so about three years into the cafe, people keep telling me, Jeremy, well, we want your recipes. Can you share us the recipes? So I thought I'd do a cookbook and um, share some of the recipes from the cafe with people. And um, before I knew it, it got out of control and I had about eight cookbooks. Wow. So uh, they've been amazing. I've probably sold about 180,000 of them. Amazing. They've just been amazing. They're on the bestseller list in New Zealand bookshops. And um, it's just a really great way of sharing, you know, healthy whole food with the people from the cafe. They're also my wife's favourite cookbooks. Oh, great! Good yeah, to hear. She says she loves them. And then on the other side here, we have what is going to be my breakfast in a few minutes. <laughs> That's right. We've just started a new breakfast menu. Yeah. Um, so we've got a whole lot of cold stuff here. We've got chia puddings. We've got a tofu yogurt, birch and muesli fruit salad. Um, we've got our own granola there. And um, up here is all the hot meals. We've got the best scrambled tofu in the world, which is the Thai scrambled tofu. We've got an apple porridge, um, Boston baked beans, and uh, some roasties there with sweet potato. So um, it's a really, really yummy menu. Now, what are the principles that guide the type of cooking you do? Um, so it's all about whole food plant-based, so keeping everything as, as natural as possible. Um, we don't use sugar, so for example, we sweeten things with date puree. We don't deep fry. We only use healthy oils like olive oil and coconut oil. Um, we don't use very, very preservative free. Um, just a great healthy way to eat. Of course, we're vegetarian and um, don't use meat. Wonderful. Now, what, what started your interest, first of all, in healthy food? Um, well, I went to a health retreat with my wife in, around, in the early 2000s, and we kind of got inspired to just eat really, really healthy. Um, and also, at that stage, I worked for sanitarium, so I kind of had a good dose of, you know, eat healthy, you're going to live longer. Right. So I wanted an adventure in my life, wanted to, you know, love the health mission, so I decided to go on an adventure and start a cafe. Fantastic. Now, so you have this cafe here, and yes. then you have a second one not so far away. Yes, one on Lawn Street, which is two blocks up. So basically mainly catering to the inner city crowd, so at lunchtime it's just packed with office workers and people. And the interesting thing is, people that come here are not vegetarian. Right. They're just people who want to come for healthy, healthy food. They're all, all meat eaters, but they appreciate the, the whole food, healthy diet. Okay, so um, one, one important aspect of what you're doing is to help people live more healthfully. Do you have yes. a bigger mission? Um, yeah, one thing I'd like to do is um, I see a lot of um, kind of health-based cafes around the world try to start up, and, um, and often it's very, very tough, and they often fail very quickly. I know a lot of people have got their heart and mission. They'd love to do this type of thing. And when I started, it was very difficult. It's a very, very cutthroat industry to be in. It's very, very tough. So I'd love to be able to... I'm trying to work on a model where I can share with people so they can actually take up this model, kind of like a franchise, and have all the recipes, all the way, the systems, the way to make a business run really well so they can start and be successful. So that's one thing I'm, I'm working on at the moment. I'd love to be in a position to share with really soon. Terrific. Can you tell me a story of how you have connected with people through the cafe? Yeah, sure. Um, probably first, I just probably get almost daily emails and contacts from people saying, how yeah, I love your recipes. The cookbooks have changed my life. I can give my family healthy food they actually love to eat, um, which is, is just really great. I've had people crying saying, you just changed my life, which is just really humbling to know that you know, I've been used in this kind of way. And, uh, and once we had um, a visiting speaker, Leo Shrevan, come to, ta come to Auckland, and I managed to invite um, 200 of my cafe customers to go to his seminars, which was fantastic to get that, that great message. Yeah, terrific. Now, you also... You have a presence in the media because of what you're doing, and so you can actually attract people to come to cooking demonstrations. Tell me about that. That's right. Yes, yeah, so um, I've tried different things like you know getting health professionals, and that didn't really work. Tried seminars in the cafe, didn't really work. But one thing that really did work is inviting people back to my church and giving them cooking demonstrations. Okay. And um, I think the most I've had is 150 people turn up for a cooking demonstration. So people really love to learn and see you actually cook healthy food in front of them. So that's one area I, I do. Um, with the churches and obviously I've got some TV programs now with Cook30 um, on Hope and 3ABN um, that um, you know, show people how to do it on TV as well. So really sharing how people can actually do it through, through TV and media. Fantastic. Now, you told me 180,000 books. Yes. Now, in, 
is that through the internet? Is it through bookshops? How? Uh, mainly through bookshops in New Zealand, um, through the ABCs in Australia and New Zealand. And also I've got something on Amazon. They sell on Amazon in the States as well, the Revive Cafe cookbooks. Um, and they just seem to be, be selling really well. When I first started, I, print, I printed 4,000 in my first book. I'm like, oh, are these going to sell or not? But they just sold out within a couple of months. So um, I've really had a spot there. With, and I think my style of cooking is very simple and easy yes. using whole foods. So people really appreciate that you can just get a few ingredients, throw them in a pan and have a meal really quickly. It's, they're not complicated. My style is very simple. So I think that has really resonated with, with people. Yeah, no doubt about that. Now, describe for our viewers where these cafes are located. So we're in central Auckland now, which is this, the central business district of Auckland. So Wyndham Street and Lawn Street, which is just off the main street of Queen Street, uh, just in the main area where people come from all the businesses. So they're a yeah, great, great place Prime to come to. Location. Prime location. Yeah, good location. Yeah. Just off the beaten track. And, um, and, it's, and it's really easy to get people. You just do fly drops and tell people where you are and do offers and things. And so there's a lot of marking that goes on to keep things trucking along. Now, the industry that you're in is notorious for burning people out. I mean, investing so much energy and time, how do you and your wife keep balance? Um, I suppose I've got to the stage now where I don't work in here all the time. So right. I've got a great tech crew here. I've got managers in each store, a head chef, an operations manager that runs the whole outfit and improves it. So I think it's just being um, getting people on to help. You can't do it all yourself. Right. I mean, in the first few weeks when you start and you've got the enthusiasm, you can work long hours, but that quickly dies. So it's really important to... Um, to have, pe to have people in there to work for it. And it's got to be a working, profitable business model so you can afford to, to employ people. You can't just do it all yourself or you, you burn out very quickly. Right. So, Jeremy, what would be your hope for the future? Um, I'd like to see... Oh, we've got two branches now of the cafes and the, and the cookbooks. I'd like to keep expanding influence. I'd love to see revives in more, more cities around the world and more of a spiritual impact as well and just helping people in other areas of their life. So that's my, my kind of goals from here, to work on that, to... To, 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 to increase the, the sphere of revised influence. Fantastic. Well, I'm getting hungry, so we need to <laughs> finish the interview. Mate. Thank you so no much. No worries. Okay. And viewers at home, um, what a wonderful thing happening here in Urban Centre of Influence that's connecting with people's needs right here in Auckland, New Zealand. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to the beautiful harbour area of Auckland, New Zealand. Next we meet Pastor Umesh Nag, who is the Global Mission Coordinator for the Southern Asia region of the world. I'm here in India, in front of the beautiful Taj Mahal, one of the seven wonders of the world. This is a place full of colour, full of culture, full of spices and taste. And I'm here with uh, Pastor Umesh Nag, who's the Coordinator for Global Mission here at the Southern Asia Division. Pastor, thank you for joining us. Um, your story begins, well actually you shouldn't say begin, but you had a baptism before you had a conversion. And that's a great start for any story. Can you share with us your conversion? Yeah, sure. Actually, I also sometimes when I'm thinking about my conversion, I baptized first and then I converted. It means uh, when I baptized, I didn't know about the Jesus Christ. Uh, my family, they were taking baptism and I'm also joined with them. The pastor said, okay, you also can bapt bap take baptism because you are almost 12 years old. So I did it, and uh, I baptized. But the real conversion uh, took place around 1999, 16 March. You know, um, we belong to poor family. We were poor because only my father's bread earner, and we are six brothers and one sister. It's very hard to survive. So when I was just 10 years old, I started working outside to earn money. And uh, in this uh, situation, you know, I, I became an alcoholic and same time chain smoker. And this became too much. And same time, I, you know, I just like uh, 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 the criminal habit and some other stuff also have been involved. There is some evil things. Maybe you cannot explain so many things I, have, I used to do in those days. But it's a God is really great God. Uh, one time, just I wanted to away from my family because I had some police case and other things. And my family doesn't like, they don't like me at all. Because they said, okay, did he, because of you, our full family, are, uh, the name, their name is spoiling. Oh, I was shocked. And I was so much disappointed, actually. 
Oh, my mother told me like this. Get lost from my house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, I, I, I remember that my, my elder brother got married and he said, don't come to my marriage because you're not a good guy. <laughs> Oh, this is shocking actually, this sadness. Uh, it's disappointing me a lot. So suddenly our uh, pastor Arthur David, he was a Adventist church pastor. And uh, he, without my uh, knowledge, he filled my form for Bible seminary, which going to, uh, uh, which held in uh, there in Jalandhar. So, and uh, he told me, you want to go there? For the Bible seminary, even I didn't know what is the meaning seminary. <laughs> but you know, I said, okay, yes, I want to go because I want to just get lost from here, this house, because people don't like me and I'm very disappointed. So I reached there with smoke and so many things are there. And uh, you know, to cut short my story, 5th of uh, March, uh, I faced an interview. When I faced an interview, people asked me about the Bible. But I didn't know about the, what is this? What is the Bible? Uh, where the Matthew, where the Mark? I didn't know anything. I, I don't know how to pray. But I don't know. Uh, they asked me, why you came here? You want to be pastor? I said, no, I don't want to be pastor. They said, why you came here? Then I said, yes, I came here to just to know about, uh, you know, God and Jesus and Jesus. And my mother used to tell a story about Jesus. Okay. I don't know why, what things inspired them. They, uh, they took me. And then, but the problem is this, I was a chain smoker. Every half an hour, I need to go for the smoking. And I saw this other student there, almost 40 we were there. They look like an angel. They know Bible. They know how to pray. And you know, our director, sometimes they call everyone, you know, anyone, just choose, uh, come, for pray for food. I, I, I hide myself, okay, because I don't know how to pray. Uh, then, uh, 16 March, I thought, this, is, this place not belong to me. Because see, these people are, if they know Bible is, if somebody will know about, my, uh, for, about me, then I'm a smoker and this all other bad habit also. Maybe the, what reaction will be, maybe they will chase me out and there will be big insult for me. Then I thought, let me go from here. Because, you know, because of alcohol, because I smoke, my right lungs was totally damaged. And doctor said, there's no hope. If you'll not have the proper treatment, you will die. So I took a little bit of uh, treatment, but uh, not completed the course, and I came out because I want to come out from the home. Uh, then what happened? 16 March 1999, around nine, 10 o'clock. I just, because I didn't know how to pray, but I was very much disappointed, very much disappointed. I said, God, I just kneeled down. I knelt down and uh, I said, God, I know you are there. People are believing. I also believe too. But this habit, I cannot leave smoking. I tried my level, but I couldn't give. But I want it. If you want me to be here, do something. Otherwise, I want to go back from here. This is not a place for me. Then, uh, 17 March, I just I prayed and I just I slept. 17 March, Sunday morning, it was a new day for me. Oh, I enjoyed with uh, all the students. I forgot that I'm a chance smoker. There's no, uh, like, uh, my body is not forced to go and have a smoke. 18, 17 March, I enjoyed. 18 March, I enjoyed. 19 March, oh, I saw somebody smoking. And I felt like crying. I said, thank God. You removed that floppy. You delete that habit from my life. And it was a new day for me. And I accepted Christ. It's my real conversion. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful story. God completely rescued you and healed you, pretty much, from, from your smoking habits and other things. And then after that, you became a global mission pioneer, and you became a church pastor, and you led a seminary for 30 pastors, as you indicated, and today you've been appointed as the global mission coordinator here in the Southern Asia Division. Oh, yeah. How's this going here? What's the current situation as far as global mission in your territory? Yeah, uh, last year, I think, uh, I mean, uh, this year only, 2016, as I appointed as a global mission pioneer. You know, the one interesting thing I will let you tell you. I started my job as a global mission pioneer, <laughs> and God blessed me with this position. Now I'm a director of uh, the global mission department in Southern Asia Division. And uh, th it is all credit goes to God. His name will be glorified. We have around 247 volunteer uh, pioneers in the, all over the North. Um, 
We have stopped uh, South India. Actually, South India, they, are, they themselves are very much enough to work and appoint the pastor, but North have lots of work. You can see here in the Taj Mahal, there's lots of people here, 99 people, not, they don't know about Jesus Christ. So North, like Maharashtra and the North India Union, we consider almost 14 states. And Northeast, Nepal, Bhutan, and that part, they need lots of pioneer. So we are working out and really, uh, God is uh, going to open the more door for us. You're in the second most populated country in the world, so I'm sure pioneers is something that you would need many more of. These are men who are entering uh, regions where there's no Seventh-day Adventist presence. What are some of the challenges that they face as they encounter these unentered areas? Even many of the group, they don't know about Jesus at all. So this is my biggest challenge, how to reach them. And to reach them, the second challenge comes how to get a dedicated person. This is my biggest challenge. Because, you know, uh, to do the work, the God's work, to reach the unreached places, we need some kind of, you know, have a uh, person who know Bible, person who uh, have some education must be there, to know how to talk, and, you know, to understand the cross-culture ministry, and we are lacking with that. So we are not uh, have enough worker. Secondly, if you have enough worker, but we don't have fund, this also matter. I know the God is great. He will open the door for us, but that is a matter. So what we are giving to our pioneers, that's not sufficient for even village. And now we are targeting to the cities. This is a great challenge uh, uh, to get more fund so that we can knock many people groups door to enter them. Pastor Umash, thank you so much. I know there's many challenges in your region, but we can hear and see your passion for God's ministry here through Global Mission Work. Uh, thank thank you. you for joining us. Uh, I just uh, want to you pray. Uh, I want that this world church join, uh, uh, join my hand and pray together. Pray that we can reach unreached place. Pray that can we have more pioneers. Pray that uh, people will open their heart to receive the gospel masses for internal life. Thank you very much. And we invite you at home to pray that the God will send more global mission pioneers and more pastors and more church workers in this region. I'm Yarley Simon reporting for Mission 360. Next up, we see how Adventist physicians through Pathways to Health are following Jesus' pathway of showing compassion and healing to the community. Through a humanitarian service called Your Best Pathway to Health, 4,400 members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, along with friends, family members, and colleagues, organized and hosted a free mega-clinic on an epic scale. Partners came together to make the mega-clinic a reality. Adventist Layman Services and Industries, together with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Adventist Health, through local hospitals, including White Memorial Medical Center, Glendale Adventist Medical Center, and Simi Valley Hospital, along with Loma Linda University Health, provided invaluable resources. While notable manufacturers, such as GE and Konica Minolta, among many others, donated the use of key medical equipment. In addition, the office of Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti along with several districts and their councilmen, rallied to support the humanitarian event in a continued effort to serve the residents of Los Angeles. Once again, volunteers came from all parts of North America and some from abroad. Dentists, physicians, specialists, practitioners, chaplains, nurses, dental hygienists, beauticians, registration and hospitality workers, communication professionals, lifestyle coaches, and vision care specialists, among many others. They served until their feet were sore and their eyelids were heavy, and yet neither their smiles nor their gentle spirit ever wore off. Meanwhile, the residents of Los Angeles and some who came from as far as northern Idaho and Texas lined up once again for services beyond their financial reach. Some spent the night in anticipation of doors that would open in the morning. 
doors of healing, doors of hope. Thousands were served, thousands were loved by thousands who responded to a calling to love like Jesus and to serve like Jesus. By the end of the third day, 8,537 patients had received medical and dental attention they so desperately needed, together with friendship, encouragement, and most importantly, hope. That is mission. That is mission accomplished. That is mission accomplished together. Well, that's about it for today's program, and I hope that you've been challenged and inspired by what you've seen and heard. Around the world today, many global mission pioneers and other church planters are starting new groups of believers, and I want to thank you so much for the part that you play in making that happen. You may ask, well, what do I do? Well, your prayers make a difference. Your financial support makes a difference. It does make a big, big difference to frontline workers to know that there is a world church praying and supporting them. And I want to ask you to please find ways in your own community to share the light of Christ's love. Before we go, I'd like to send you a small thank you gift for your participation in Adventist Mission. It's a book by Gina Wallin called True Believer, and it takes us back to the former Soviet Union, and we'll see faith in action in this book. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krauss, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.